So this PowerPoint is going to go over all the pathogenic RNA viruses versus all the ones that have DNA as their main genetic information. Now, there are a lot of RNA viruses that cause human disease compared to the number of DNA viruses. So this is a lengthier PowerPoint than the DNA virus. So I'm going to break it up into two lectures, two recordings, just for a break point. You can play them right back, you know, back to back, but I'm just going to record them as two separate recordings. Now, because there are so many RNA viruses, we have to group them and subgroup them. So we group them one, they all have RNA as their genetic material. Uh, whether they have an envelope or not, we group them by their size. We also group them by the shape of their capsid. Now, they do all have RNA as their genetic material, but there's variety in that itself. Some of them have a single strand of RNA, but they've got the positive strand, the one that can be read by ribosomes themselves. There are some that have the single strand of RNA, but they have the negative or the opposite strand, the one that can't get read by ribosomes. Then there are some that have that single strand, the positive strand, but they do something really unique. They take their single strand of RNA and they do reverse transcription and they make double-stranded DNA from it. Normal transcription, double-stranded DNA to a single-stranded RNA, that messenger RNA, they do it in reverse, very unique. So we call them our retroviruses. And then we've got a really small group of viruses that have double-stranded RNA. Now, the own viruses, consider the fact that they've got RNA as their genetic material, they are the only organisms out there that store their information as RNA. Like every, every other living organism out there has DNA as its genetic material. Now, this is a nice big grouping of all the different ways we've sorted all the RNA viruses that we're going to talk about. So again, some of them have the positive strand single stranded RNA, and they don't have an envelope versus ones that do. Some are the ones that have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to do reverse transcription. We've got a bunch of enveloped negative stranded single stranded RNA. Sometimes they're Genetic material is in segments. Sometimes it's one big large chunk of RNA. And then one tiny little family up here that we're gonna finish off the PowerPoint with is if it's double-stranded RNA. So we're gonna start here and work our way around uh, going up to that Rio, Rio of your day at the very, very top. So we're gonna start with our naked, so they don't have any envelope and they all have a single strand of RNA, and they've got the positive strand, the one that can get read by the ribosomes. Now, there are four, two of them we grouped together, four families of Picornoviridae, Calisoviridae, Astroviridae, and Hepaviridae. These, based on their shape and what they cause, we usually talk about them together. So the Picornoviridae, the biggest one up here, they are size-wise the smallest of all the animal viruses, and there are lots of human pathogens in that Picornoviridae group. There are rhinoviruses, there's our enteroviruses that we're gonna talk, there's a bunch of enteroviruses, and there's a hepatovirus. The Calisoviridae and Astroviridae, those were the two we talk about because they shape-wise are the same and they cause similar uh, issues. And size-wise, they're bigger than the Picornoviridae and the, the hepaviridae. This is one that uh, it's, I was gonna say, it's another uh, hepatitis based on its name, but they're all gonna cause or have some spread or something fecal oral or cause gastrointestinal issues, um, which is why they're all kind of talked about together. So we're gonna start first with the picornoviridae group. And again, lots of viruses in the picornoviridae group. The first one is the rhinovirus. Rhino means nose. It does affect the upper respiratory tract, causing you to have a runny nose. And so the rhinoviruses, and there's lots of rhinoviruses, there's over 150 different strains of rhinoviruses, and they are the top virus that cause the common cold. There's lots of viruses that can cause the common cold. Rhinoviruses are the number one. Now, other than the fact there are lots of different strains of rhinoviruses, the infectious dose is only one. So you just need one virus to get in the body and you're gonna get a cold. And those viruses are transmitted by aerosols, 
touching inanimate or just touching hand-to-hand uh, -hand contact, touching inanimate objects that have the virus on it, but person-to-person -person contact is the most common way of spreading. And the viruses can remain on inanimate objects for hours outside of the body and are still viable for someone to come around and touch it, like when you guys touch your tables. Now, the good news is that people do start to develop some immunity to these viruses. So the more colds you have, the less now, the less colds you will have in the future. They figure that kids usually have between six and eight colds caused by the rhinovirus every year. By the time you get to an adult, two to three caused by rhinoviruses because you are developing some immunity against these. Now, rhinoviruses, to diagnose them, they usually go based on symptoms. Most people don't even go to the doctor to get diagnosed with the cold, uh, but they can. There are some further tests they can do to confirm. Otherwise, treatment at Early onset of symptoms, they can give Placonorol or Picovir. It shortens how long you have the cold. It's an antiviral. Otherwise, all the other medications are just relieving the symptoms. Pain medications, congestion medications, things like that. Uh, best prevention is just hand washing. They can't come up with a vaccine. They're not even trying to de develop a vaccine against rhinoviruses because there's over 150 strains. They don't share common antigens and they change. So they can mutate and change all the time. Now the enterovirus group, still in the Picornaviridae group, but the enterovirus group, anything that has that entero in it has something to do with the intestines. Now these don't target the intestines, instead they're all grouped in here because they're spread fecal oral, which you know what that means, everyone eats poop. So they don't affect the intestines, they just are spread fecal oral. Instead, most of these are going to cause issues with uh, the pharynx. They can get in and pass the pharynx. They can get in and pass the intestines. They are then spread via blood all around the body, infecting various cells in the body, depending on which virus. They usually kill their host cells. And there are three main enteroviruses that we're going to talk about. The poliovirus, the Coxsackie viruses, and the echoviruses. So some are more severe than others. And we're going to first start with the polio virus. Now, the official virus name is poliomyelitis, or the condition is poliomyelitis. We usually just shorten it to polio. Lucky for us, the last known documented case of polio in the United States was 1979. So for most of you, you were never alive when polio was here in the United States. Now, if you asked your grandparents, your parents, yes, they would be able to describe what it was like when individuals in their class, other people they knew, were picking up this virus. Now, there are four conditions that you could have if you picked up this particular virus. For about 90% of individuals, asymptomatic, which means you could be spreading it without knowing it. About 5% develop minor polio. Usually it's tired, fever, headache. Nothing too severe. About two-ish percent develop what's known as non-paralytic polio. All those minor polio symptoms, plus usually some muscle spasms, possible back pain, the fact that it is affecting the muscles. And then paralytic polio, about another two-ish percent developed it. And this is when the virus is really targeting the spinal cord and it causes paralysis of the limbs, it causes paralysis of the diaphragm. Now, as we talked about with the botulinum and the uh, tetanus, if your diaphragm's not working, you don't survive. Now, the reason I have these couple pictures up here is that if your diaphragm's not working, you can't breathe. So, to try to help individuals survive it, so they could fight off the virus and then survive polio is they would put them in an iron lung. And so your head stuck out, you had a little mirror at the top so you could see around you, but just your head stuck out and that iron lung created pressure. And when the pressure rose in the iron lung, it pushed down on your body, causing air to leave the body. Then as the pressure decreased, it caused the lungs to expand and air to go in. So that iron lung did what your lungs are supposed to do, what the diaphragm is supposed to do, causing that pressure difference, causing air to go in and out. Now, 
Lucky for us, again, we don't have polio here in the United States. That's why the U.S. is not anywhere on this map. And luckily, the number of cases of polio are going down. This is just showing 2002. I mean, it's still out there. Uh, 2007, less and less cases. And then the first six months of 2015, when they were trying to wrap up this edition of the textbook, uh, there's still only a few cases in the Middle East. So uh, we're in Europe, I guess. Asia. Anyways, uh, in Asia. <laughs> Uh, so luckily the cases are going down, uh, but if you're traveling, it is a virus to be worried about or could be potentially worried about. Now, polio, even if you survived, you lived through the iron lung, you got rid of the virus, most individuals did survive if they were able to get into one of those iron lungs. Those individuals still, later on in life, general, most of them develop what's known as the post-polio syndrome. It's all of the polio-affected muscles, the skeletal muscles, started to deteriorate. And that's why a lot of individuals, even though they survived polio later on in the life, they were using walkers, they had to use wheelchairs, is because those muscles started to deteriorate. Now, that could take sometimes 30, 40 years before that actually happened. So, luckily, we don't really have polio around anymore because we developed a really effective vaccine. 1955 is when Jonas Salk came out with the first inactivated polio vaccine. But six years later, Albert Sabin came out with the oral, oral polio vaccine, which is a live version. Stronger immune response. However, it could happen that any time you have a live virus, it could mutate and actually cause the disease. So here in the United States, we always give the inactivated polio vaccine. Again, it's a very effective vaccine, which means we no longer have cases here in the United States. We had vaccinated enough individuals that we got rid of the virus here in the US. The next group of enteroviruses, we have Coxsackie viruses and echoviruses. The Coxsackie viruses are split into two groups and my fun factoid on why does it get the weird name Coxsackie? Well, it was named for Coxsackie in New York. So there is a city called Coxsackie in New York, and it was where they first isolated the virus. So they named it after it. Now, Coxsackie A viruses usually cause lesions of the skin accompanied by fever that can hang out for days, maybe weeks before they go away. They're still all spread fecal oral. Uh, it can also, the lesions cause something known as a herpangina. Now everyone's like, what? It sounds like herpes. Well, one of, the, one of the herpes, herpes simplex 1, or herpes human herpes virus 1, causes cold sores. So herpangina looks like lesion around the mouth. So it resembles herpes. Otherwise, hand, foot, and mouth disease, super common in children, especially in daycares. Uh, it can cause uh, hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. That's really bad pink eye. And it can also cause common colds. Lots of things can cause the common colds. There are lots of strains of Coxsackie A viruses. Now the Coxsackie B viruses are usually a little bit more severe. They can usually cause inflammation around the heart uh, and a lot of times can cause a fever. It is a virus. The Coxsackie B virus can cross the placental barrier and cause damage to organs and developing fetuses. So I'm like, if you had to pick a Coxsackie virus, you would want A. It's more annoying lesions of the skin. Now, both of them can cause meningitis. It's not as deadly of a meningitis as other viruses and other bacteria, but both of them can lead to a meningitis. The last of the enteroviruses that are spread fecal oral is the echoviruses. It stands for enteric, it's fecal oral, cytopathic human orphan. Because for a long time, they knew the virus existed, but they didn't know what it caused. So it was a virus without a condition. They've eventually figured out that it can cause meningitis as well as more common colds. So they finally have a code, uh, cause. Now the enteroviruses, all of those that are spread fecal oral, a lot of times aren't even diagnosed except in severe cases like polio, but we don't even really have those around that much anymore. Uh, the treatment, there's no effective antiviral treatment. At least most of them go away. They just send you home. If you've ever had to take a kid in for something like the hand, foot, mouth disease, they go, oh, it's going to go away a few days, week or two. Uh, they go away on their own. Again, unless there's severe cases, underlying issues. One of my 
they might hospitalize you, but we don't really have any effective antiviral treatment. Now, prevention, good hygiene, adequate sewage. They are spread fecal oral, and you know what that means. And we do have a vaccine against polio. Now, the final group of the Picornaviridae family, again, the little tiny viruses, is the Hepaviridae. It's the, another uh, hepatitis virus. There are five hepatitis viruses, A, B, C, D, and E. Four out of the five all have RNA. The only one that has DNA is hepatitis B. So we've got four hepatitises that are gonna be in this particular PowerPoint. So hepatitis A, it's found on surfaces. It can survive on surfaces for days. It's resistant to bleach. It's harder to kill. It's also spread fecal oral as the enteroviruses are, but genetically it's not considered an enterovirus. Signs and symptoms, usually about a month after picking with the virus, the symptoms start to appear. Usually fever, fatigue, nausea, jaundice, because it is causing inflammation of the liver. There's usually no chronic or long-lasting liver disease. 99% of the time, people make a complete recovery, but we can prevent the vaccine, or we can prevent the virus because we do have a two-dose vaccine. Now, what I said before, yes, there are five hepatitises all together, and all of them are RNA viruses, except hepatitis B has DNA. Now, our next group, we're still unenveloped, naked, positive scent, single-stranded RNA, and there's two families in here, but we group them together, the calissoviruses and the astroviruses, because they cause very similar issues. They both cause acute gastroenteritis, aka they're affecting the intestines, they're causing inflammation of the intestines, leading to diarrhea and or nausea. So the first group, the calissoviruses, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Now anything in the calissovirus can cause that. The one particular virus that usually most people know of are the noroviruses, which are in that group. And the noroviruses are more known by their nickname, the cruise ship virus, because when you put a lot of people together, and they're all really close together, sharing and touching very similar items, that it spreads really, really quickly. And it's not the way you wanna spend your cruise is diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Astroviruses cause diarrhea, but no vomiting. And they get their name astro because they said that they look like little stars, which is what astro means. Now there's usually outbreaks in buildings where you have lots of people all hanging out together like daycares, schools, hospitals, mostly because it's causing vomiting, diarrhea. It's the treatment is just replace the fluids and electrolytes. The virus will eventually go away on its own with your own immune system and with the diarrhea. Best is not to pick it up because sewage treatment, hand washing, disinfecting surfaces, these are all spread fecal oral. And so again, yep, you're eating poop. Now, the last little group on here that is naked and positive since single, single stranded RNA is another hepatitis. So we had hepatitis A, now we're gonna go all the way to hepatitis E. It is an enteric hepatitis, so it can affect the intestines and it does lead to vomiting as one of the symptoms. Otherwise, other symptoms is fever, fatigue, and anytime you have inflammation of the liver, it can actually cause jaundice. Now, because it's spread fecal oral and because it can cause the vomiting, for a long time, the hepatitis E virus was even classified as a calissivirus, like the norovirus. And they figured out genetically it's different. Now, the unique part of hepatitis, because it, of hepatitis E, is because, you know, it is causing fever, it is causing jaundice, it is causing inflammation of the liver. It only, you know, it can be fatal in about 4% of the population. Again, those that have underlying condition, that's going to be... Uh, a little on the higher end, but they have noticed that it's fatal in 20% of pregnant women. They believe it's due to the increase in hormones that actually triggered this virus to do more damage to the liver and even damage to the immune system. So it's kind of a unique group of individuals. Now, luckily, the hepatitis E is not a very common virus. It's still out there. It's just not very commonly found. We don't usually have a lot of outbreaks. Uh, it does always go away on its own. You just treat with rest fluids, uh, nutrition, 
best prevention, sewage treatment, and good hygiene because it is still also spread fecal oral. Now, on to our next group, the enveloped single-stranded RNA viruses. And we've got two groups here with the Togoviridae, and we've got a Flavoviridae. We usually talk about them together because of their shape. And then we have the Coronaviridae group, which is where this lecture is going to end up leaving off. We're going to get right to the coronaviruses and then break, and I'll record the rest of the PowerPoint. So our first group, so these are all enveloped, positive sense, single-stranded RNA. The Togoviridae and the Flavoviridae group together because their capsid structure is an icosahedral shape. A lot of them, not all of them though, a lot of them are considered arboviruses, which means they're spread by arthropods or biting insects like mosquitoes and ticks, flies, mites, spread a lot of them. Not all, we'll go over some that aren't. The Coronaviridae group, the inside of it has a helical shape. So it looks like this. If we're looking straight down, it has this twisted coil helical look to it. Now, those Togoviridae and Flavoviridae, the ones that are spread, a lot of them, but not all, are spread by insects, so they're considered arboviruses. Most of them cause mild flu-like symptoms within a week after picking up the viruses. Luckily for us, we are usually dead-end hosts for these viruses. These viruses are usually found in various insects or other animals. They usually don't get into us, that even if they get into us and they can cause a lot of serious issues, if a mosquito or a tick bites us, it doesn't pick it up and spread it to someone else. So we're kind of a dead end host. It can get to us, but then it stops there and doesn't continue with the spreading. Now, some of these viruses can affect body organs. A lot of them seem to affect the brain, causing encephalitis. Um, some and it might can cause issues with the liver or the skin or blood vessels and a lot of them can lead to second stage infections and this can happen a lot when you get a second exposure to the same virus that a lot of times the first time you get the virus symptoms aren't so bad but it can lead to a secondary or a second stage infection so the second time you pick it up the sign the Signs and symptoms are a little more severe. And so there are several viruses that can cause encephalitis where that happens, dengue fever, yellow fever. And again, it's not the first time you get the virus that's an issue, it's the second time. Now, one particular arbovirus that's spread by mosquitoes, we have it around here, is West Nile virus. It's in the Flavoviridae group. It was endemic to Africa and Israel, but one of the animals that it spreads or has helped the spread of it is that this virus is found in a lot of birds. So as birds migrate, they bring the virus with it. As a mosquito bites a bird, then a mosquito bites you, you can pick it up. Now, we do have cases of West Nile virus here in Wisconsin in our area. A lot of times, and it's one more thing to be worried about with mosquitoes, a lot of times, I was gonna say 80%, so when I say a lot, 80% are asymptomatic and about 20% usually experience kind of your basic flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, achy, fatigue. It's less than 1% that can suffer a really severe case from West Nile virus, and it can develop into encephalitis, which could be fatal. So luckily, most are asymptomatic or mild flu-like symptoms, but it can develop a more severe issue. Now, the dengue fever, a dengue hemorrhagic fever, this is showing an example of one of the viruses that can show that second stage infection. The first time you are exposed to this particular virus, again, it gets into a monocyte, it's recognized by our immune system, our immune system develop antibodies and we get rid of it. Other than the fact you have a fever, no big issues, survival. However, the second time you're exposed to this particular virus, you now have antibodies, and that should be a good thing. However, those antibodies are gonna bind up the virus. It's what they're supposed to do. Our white blood cells are going to ingest those antibodies and viruses. Our T cells, though, are gonna realize, okay, well, we need to get rid of this virus. We need to still, you know, start going out and start killing because we have an infection and the cells are gonna to start to produce these inflammatory cytokines, these chemicals. And it's our immune system that produces these inflammatory cytokines 
they almost produce too many and our immune system and these chemicals are going to produce more severe side effects the hemorrhagic fever so the fever with bleeding uh, it can put your whole body into shock it can cause bleeding out hemorrhaging and it can even cause death between 10 and 50 percent which is a big range a lot of times it depends on the person's immune system but your immune system can actually kill you because it's overactive it's making too many of those cytokines and so lots of inflammation extreme fever could lead to death now this is just showing this came right from your book uh, a whole bunch of different viruses again some we have around here in america some you got to travel but we've got groups these are all ones that are spread by insects so we've got the toga viridae group and the flava viridae group and we're going to get to a couple more down below but just looking through some of the virus names you know just looking to see if any of them stand out to you one of them should I mean, yes, we do have West Nile virus. We've talked a little bit about these guys. But look, there's La Crosse encephalitis. Everyone's like, well, that's kind of fun and unique. That can't mean this La Crosse. It absolutely means our La Crosse. We're in our textbooks. Yay! Not the exact reason we want to be in the textbook. However, in the 1960s, there was a boy that had died from encephalitis and they eventually figured out or discovered it was because of a, the specific virus, this lacrosse encephalitis virus. And because they discovered it in a boy from lacrosse, it's now called lacrosse encephalitis. So, yay! There's usually about 80 to 100 cases of lacrosse encephalitis every year. Um, I forgot I had to put Zika virus in there. Wasn't in our current textbooks yet. So this is just some of the diseases that we can have of the lacrosse encephalitis. So even though, yes, it's called lacrosse encephalitis, it's a virus spread by mosquitoes, and it's not only found in lacrosse. In, and I'm like, between this 10-year time period, again, we have about 8 to 10 a year, depends on the year, depends on the season, uh, and how it spreads, but it's not only found here in lacrosse. It's just named for us because it was discovered here so yes we're in the textbooks yay for us now the zika virus because the zika virus i had to add this in here it was not in your current textbook again i can't wait for the new textbook to come out but the zika virus is an arbovirus it's spread by mosquitoes if i go back the zika virus it's in the flavoviridae group and the big issue with the zika virus because for a lot of people with asymptomatic or mild flu-like symptoms, is that this is a virus that can cause, cross the placental barrier and develop a, into a condition for some called the Zika congenital syndrome, where it causes brain abnormalities in newborns that during development, the brain develops abnormally. Now, this became news because in South America, specifically in Brazil, they started to have an outbreak of the Zika virus. And it was around that time is when we had the Olympics scheduled down there. And so it became big news on sending all of these people to an area that was endemic for this virus and was having an epidemic of this virus at the time. So that's when it made the news. The Zika virus has been around for a while, like years, but it really didn't make the news until just a few years ago. Now, for any of these arboviruses that are spread by insects, to diagnose them, we usually do an ELISA. Most supportive care, because it can cause inflammation and fever, is usually some type of acetaminophen, some type of over-the-counter treatment, unless it's a severe case, like encephalitis. But prevention, don't get bitten. They're all spread by mosquitoes. So wear your mosquito spray that's got the, the good deets in it. Make sure you've got light colored clothing so you can see mosquitoes landing. Don't go out at dusk when mosquitoes are prevalent. Uh, and if you are traveling to areas that are endemic for some of these more unique viruses, we do have some vaccines for some of these strains. So you can always check to see where you're going and if there's a particular vaccine you need before traveling. Now, one particular virus, it's in the Togoviridae group, but it is not an arbovirus, so it's not spread by insects. 
because not all of them are. And so it's in the Tocoviridae group, and it's rubella, and it's more commonly known as the German measles. Now, it's spread by the rubella virus, and it gets into the respiratory system. It spreads throughout the body, and it causes a rash of flat to kind of pinkish red spots that usually last for around three days. Now, in children, not as serious. In adults, it can develop more serious conditions. It can develop arthritis. It can develop encephalitis. It is a big one for pregnant women that can cross the placental barrier and cause a lot of different birth defects. There are cases of it. It quite commonly causes birth defects that can cause blindness, deafness, heart abnormalities, um, cognitive disabilities, microcephaly, might be some serious birth defects. Now, one way to prevent it, we have a vaccine for it. And so because we've developed the vaccine, the number of German measles or rubella cases after we developed the vaccine went way down. Now, there has been a slow trend. Luckily, the trend went down in 14, but there has been a slow trend that we're starting to see more and more cases because we almost eliminated it from the Uni United States. But because of those not vaccinating regularly, we're starting to see an increase in the cases during most years. Another virus that's in the Flaviviridae group that's not spread by insects is hepatitis C. It causes about 20% of the United States hepatitis cases and it's spread usually by some type of bodily fluid contact, usually by blood. So sharing needles, organ transplants, it can also be spread through sexual activity and it causes a chronic infection of the body causing some severe liver damage and in 5% of the cases, liver failure. Now, luckily, and this is one, can't wait for the next textbooks to come out, is we are developing treatments. So just in the last couple editions of textbooks, it went from nothing to we have treatments now. Most of them are going to be inhibiting some type of enzyme, like a proteus enzyme in the virus itself. Uh, we, I've seen commercials. There's lots of different drugs on the market that are all inhibiting some type of viral replication, some type of enzyme the viruses need to reproduce. And the drugs we have cure about 90% of the patients in 12 weeks, that it stops the virus from reproducing. We don't have a vaccine, so we can't stop you from getting the virus, but we can at least treat you once you do. Now, our last group, the coronaviruses. Now, reason why they're called a coronavirus, the word corona means crown. If you didn't know that, it doesn't mean beer. It means crown, is that the outside of them have little tiny proteins, little glycoproteins that stick out, that they said it looks like a little crown around the virus itself. Now, all coronaviruses are spread by respiratory droplets, like coughing, sneezing, and they're gonna affect the respiratory tract. Now, coronaviruses cause about one third of the common colds out there. So I know in the recent news, we always talk about, oh, the, the coronaviruses, the coronaviruses. I'm like, well, if you've had the common cold, about a third of them have been caused by coronaviruses. So you may have had a coronavirus but there are different kinds of coronaviruses out there. And so that's why we can't just keep calling them a coronavirus as we need to start calling them things like COVID-19. It's a specifically named coronavirus. Now, one particular strain of coronaviruses, the one that really until recently was the only one that was kind of discussed is the one that causes the severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. This was an emerging disease. There was lots of cases of this particular virus in China. It caused fever, it caused headaches, and it caused respiratory distress, especially those that are immunocompromised, that it actually killed about 10% of cases. So it, it, again, it caused respiratory distress where you literally can't get enough oxygen in the body for survival. Now, there isn't any treatment or vaccine that we have. I mean, there are various things we can do to help treat, but there's no universal treatment. Um, they have been working on a SARS vaccine though. And uh, so, I mean, we were pretty close to a SARS vaccine that's 
effective and given to everyone. Uh, it just takes a long time to develop all the testing. And what was nice is, although we did have a big outbreak of this particular virus, the number of cases has been on the decline. Now, another one that's in the coronavirus group is also called MERS, M-E-R-S, and it's the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which actually, I'm like, even though, yes, we had cases in the Middle East, we actually had a higher number in Europe in 2015, more deadly than SARS. However, for whatever reason, we had a small kind of outbreak of it, and then it seemed to subside, and we're not sure why. Now, the one that is making all the news now is our coronavirus COVID-19. And so a little bit of information on that. And again, anytime I look, there's more and more information. But right now for COVID-19, because it is a relatively new virus, we don't have all the answers. We don't have all the information. And it could easily take us years before we know all of the answers. But I tried to put a couple slides in here of what are some top questions that people ask. And so one of the big one, and I, my note on there, information is changing. So I'm recording this. Some of this information can be changed even by the time you listen to it, I'm not sure. But one of the questions is always, where did it come from? This is an emerging virus. Well, what happens with viruses is they, they can change, they can mutate, and it appeared that this was a virus that was found in bats. This is genetic-wise where they're thinking it came from. And that might change. I've heard lots of different animals, but bat seems to be the most definitive answer. Where did it come from? That this virus was found in bats. And for some reason, something in the virus changed just a little bit that it now is a virus that can infect, infect humans. And so that virus had to get from bats to humans. So an infected bat had to spread that virus to a human. How? We're not sure. Is it you know, human eating an infected animal? Did someone eat a bat? Was it they were exposed to an infected feces or urine? Um, we're, not, we're not sure on the answers on that, but our best, best guess right now is that it did come from bats based on the genetic itself, the genetics. Now, how it spread, number one reason or number one way it spread, respiratory droplets, so coughing or sneezing. However, the virus can survive at inanimate objects for how long is a little up in the air. I've seen anywhere from four days to 17 days. Again, we don't know all the specifics yet. There are some suspicions. It might be spread in feces. It might be airborne, hanging out in the air for longer periods of time versus respiratory droplets. They're gonna not stay in the air very long. They're gonna fall with the fluid. So they, they think there may be a few cases rare might be spread feces might be a few cases rare might be spread airborne um, but right now top is respiratory droplets followed by contaminated inanimate objects the question you know well do people develop immunity if you get COVID-19 uh, which is more officially also called SARS-CoV-2 so you might see that in places too do you develop immunity to it can you get it again I don't know for sure I've read conflicting responses, but luckily most of the responses look like you might develop some immunity to it. And so those that have already had the coronavirus seem to less likely pick it up again. However, how long that immunity lasts? Is it, are you immune for a year? Are you immune for 10 years? Are you immune for the rest of your life? We have no idea, and that could take us decades to find out. We have to follow these in infected individuals uh, and constantly look for antibodies to see if they still have immunity and for how long. And then the big is what can you do to prevent infection? What can you do to prevent the spreading? Well, coffer, covering your cough or sneeze with a tissue and then making sure that goes in the garbage right away, cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched objects, make sure you stay home if you're sick. These are all things you've probably been hearing in the news and all over, uh, billboards, wherever. Don't touch your face. Don't travel if you feel sick. Um, contact healthcare workers by phone if you think you might have symptoms before they go get tested. So we can prevent the spread of this particular virus. Again, it's a lot in the news and lots and lots of things are changing uh, with data every day. We're finding out new things, new treatments. We're trying new things. Now, I'm going to end this recording right here. This is 
PowerPoint slide number, we're about halfway, but not quite through with the halfway number of viruses to get through. And I'm going to pick this up in a second recording.